asymptotics and eventually I'm going to get uh, exact expressions for these correlators. The second method actually works for all values of the, of the loop weight, beta. It's going to use uh, conformal invariance, and I'm going to show you how it works. So first, instead of uh, wor st studying these correlators on the rectangle, I'm going to study them on a different geometry of a, a thin strip. I'm going to use the transform computation and conformal invariance to recover uh, once again, uh, these correlators. And of course, my goal is to compare the two approaches and see if they yield the same results. So this is basically the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to have approach one and then approach two in the second part. So here's my loop model on the rectangle. So I have this, uh, these square tiles. And in on these tiles, I have two plaquettes. And then I insert some boundary conditions made of these arcs and these uh, outgoing uh, strands, which are called defects. In general, I'm going to call Dirichlet boundary conditions. I have these simple arcs, and when I boundary conditions. In my talk, uh, I'm going to fix the boundary conditions on the left, top, and right side to be Dirichlet. And on the bottom, I'm going to have uh, something special, and some defects and some arcs, which and I'm going to be more clear on this in the slides. Uh, so on a given configuration, like this one, you have two types of loops. One of them are closed loops, like this one, or this one here. I'm, I'm going to call those bulk loops, and these are going to have a weight beta. Uh, so Second type of loop I called boundary loops. These are loops, these are not really closed loops. They start from a defect and then end at another defect. In general, I could give these a, di a different uh, weight, a weight gamma, which I'm going to fix to one. But once the boundary condition is fixed, uh, if I computed the partition function, the sum over the configurations, due to the weight gamma, it would sort of trivially factorize. In this example here, I always have two such loops, and I would have a gamma squared appearing in front. So I'm just going to set gamma equals to 1. So in particular, th uh, the model of critical dense polymers, beta is set to 0. So that means that for every configuration that contributes to this partition function, I don't have any bulk loops. I only have these, these boundary loops, like the ones that I have here. Okay, so th the correlators that I'm going to study are boundary correlators. I'm going to do something special on the lower segment that's going to depend on two positions, x and y, compute this partition function. And then divide by z0. z0 is a representation function. Uh, the natural choice, whenever beta is generic, so basically any value of zero in this case, is to set just Dirichlet boundary conditions on all sides. This gives me a well-defined partition function. For beta equals zero, this doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is, of course, I always have at least one closed loop, and so the, this partition function would be zero. Instead, what I'm going to choose as a reference partition function is uh, one where I include two that are neighbors in a position x. And it's not very hard to see that this partition function does not depend on the position x. So here's why. So first, let me go back to the case where I have, instead of two defects, I have an arc. Natural choice for this, for this uh, reference partition function is to say I'm going to consider all configurations where I have a unique uh, loop. This is one of them. Okay, and then I'm going to take the sum over all these configurations. So this can be achieved in two ways. The first is to compute the partition function for generic values of beta. It's a polynomial in beta, and then divide by beta and take the limit beta to zero. Uh, a more convenient way is actually to say, I'm going to choose one special arc, any one, and I'm going to in general have weight zero, except the one that crosses this arc, and this one has weight one. And this, I don't have to take a limit to beta. This is already setting beta equals to zero, but it's choosing a special cut this arc in half and say these are two defects and it has weight one. And so indeed, I can put it anywhere I want and uh, it's independent of x. Okay, so now I want to tell you what I'm computing in the, in the numerator. I'm, I'm going to present six types of correlation functions. These are the types A, B, and C. So for type A, I'm going to include in position x one defect and then likewise one defect in position y. The correlation function is the ratio of this partition function divided by the reference partition function. Type B, likewise in X and Y, this time I have two defects instead of just one. Type C, now I have a collection of defects between X and Y. So basically X and Y are transitions between uh, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. These are three types. So types D and E. So for type D, I'm going to choose on the lower segment a uh, boundary condition which is a Neumann type. And I'm going to set X and Y to defects. Okay, and C. I drew these in, in, uh, in 
in red. And at x, there's a cluster that lives at x. And this cluster, in this example here, it, it is the same cluster as the one that touches y, but this is not always the case. And so the correlation function I'm studying is, is related to this partition function, zd, where I take the sum for all configuration with the weight I had before, but then I impose that same cluster, the cluster at x is the same as the cluster at y. Likewise for type E, now instead I focus on defects. So I study two defects, and I consider the partition function restricted to configurations where the defect x is actually connected to the defect at y. And again, this gives me a well-defined uh, correlation function. I'm going to study last type of one last type of correlator, uh, of type f. And for this case, again, I include uh, Neumann boundary conditions on the lower segment. But I divide this lower segment in three parts, one, two, and three. And I drew, type, I drew the segment number two in pink. And now I'm going to consider how the, the boundary loops that connect the lower segment, I'm going to treat them separately depending on the connect type, uh, the first or second part of the segment or the second and third. So here I, I drew, uh, I drew uh, in pink the boundary loops that connected my segment one with segment two and segment two with segment three. So my correlator of type F is, again, sum over all configurations with beta to the number of bulk loops. And then I have an extra parameter tau for all the loops that, three loops that connect segment two to the other two segments. Okay, so this, this correlation function depends on an extra parameter. It's also, this correlation function of type F is also related to a measure of uh, entanglement entropy called valence bond entanglement entropy. This is the average number of loops that connects my second segment to the other segments. And you can obtain this, uh, this observable by taking a derivative of type my type F correlator with respect to tau and then setting tau equals to one. Okay, so the next, yes, okay. So in my two approaches, one of them is gonna be lattice derivations and the second one is gonna be conformal field theory derivations. And the, uh, so usually what you have on the lattice, whenever you have a change in boundary condition, in the CFT, it corresponds to uh, inserting a, a boundary condition changing field, phi x or phi y. Uh, and of course, so these loop models are actually critical models, and they're, they're, uh, they're described by logarithmic CFTs. Here, uh, the conformal symmetry, whenever you have primary fields, it constrains the form of the two-point function very very uh, heavily, basically it fixes its form up to a constant, so there's a constant times uh, the, the difference of the two positions to the power two delta, and delta is the conformal weight of the corresponding field. So this is what we're gonna try to reproduce using the lattice results. Uh, in particular, we're gonna try to compute these, these deltas. One way to compute these deltas uh, is, this is using this cal formula. So uh, again, CFT tells us that when we have a partition function on a rectangle uh, and we take its log, it has a large m and n expansion where the first term and the second term are non-universal. They involve uh, bulk free energy and surface free energies. And then you have a third term, uh, which is due to the corners, and then you have, uh, which is with a logarithm of m times n. And uh, the coefficient uh, is the sum over the corners and involves the primary fields of the fields that you inserted in the corners. So this is also going to be a technique that we're going to use to extract the conformal weight. Okay, so in this slide, I present the result of our computation. So of course, these computations are going to be presented in the two sections, but here I'm, I'm giving you the results already from the, from the beginning. So for type A, okay, for a type A, B, and C, so I have two columns. One of them are, are lattice computations, and the other one are the CFT computations for all values of beta. This one is for the model of polymers. Uh, so for type A, what we found is that uh, the, the two-point function behaves as k times r to the one over four. So this is a parola, like, this, like the one that we are able to predict using CFT with an exponent, which is uh, minus one over eight. The CFT tells us that this exponent is written as two times delta com one comma two. These are the conformal weights uh, in the CATS table. This is the, the formula. So depends on these two labels, r and s and T, which labels my model uh, via this, this equation. Okay. And, and indeed, uh, for polymers, so the central charge is minus two, my conformal weights are written as, as follows, and delta one comma two gives me one eighth, like what I have here. 
for type B, this is the, the case where I had two defects going to two defects. For polymers, I find something different from the parallel. I find a logarithm. And these logarithms are a, a salient feature of these, conformal the, these logarithmic conformal field theories. And it's quite nice that we're able to find this. Uh, we're able to see this from a lattice computation. Uh, for generic values of beta, what we find is that this one is actually a power law. So the beta is equal to zero is one of the non-generic cases. And this exponent uh, here, delta 1, comma 3, is also expressed as a, it's also a, a cat's conformal weight. Type C, again, we have uh, a power law. The, par the exponent is minus 3 over 32. And for generic values of beta, the exponent is delta 0, comma 1 half. So it's here the, the S label is a half integer. So tau is for type F. Type is for type F. Here, tau is gonna come is gonna come back when I discuss my results for type F. So the lambda here, so the, the beta, the, the loop weight is two cosinus lambda, and it's related to small t as lambda is pi w one minus t. Okay. In my model for polymers, yes. That's correct. That's correct. It's not a surprise. That's correct. So indeed, this model is as symplectic fermions is also the c equals to minus two uh, log cfc. Okay. So what happens for type uh, D and E? Remember, D was the cluster correlator here. What we have is is a critical exponent which is three over eight for for polymers, and for generic beta, it's delta one comma zero. Okay. For type E, when we had uh, one D, the, the loop uh, correlator, then my exponent is one, and for generic values, it's, del it's delta one comma minus one. That's correct. That's a mistake. Sorry. Um, now for type F, this is the one that depended on the extra parameter tau. So this parameter tau, now I parameterize in terms of a variable theta. Okay, and then what we find is that for polymers, the conformal weight depends on this, uh, on this value of theta, so it's uh, quadratic in theta. And for generic values of theta, well, the entries R and S uh, are linear in this theta parameter. Okay, so this is the general result uh, that we find using CFT. Okay, so now I want to tell you how I obtain these results. So I'm going to start with the lattice approach. So the lattice approach, uh, the main, the first tool that we use is the temporary leave algebra and the, the transfer operator in this algebra. So I think many of you know what this algebra is. So it's a algebra of diagrams. This is the identity, uh, the identity element, and these are the ej elements. And then uh, to multiply these elements, I just stack them and pull the string. So here, e2, e1, e3 would be this diagram. e2, e1, e3. Then I pull the strings and I get a new object, which is also an element of my algebra. Uh, more generally, when I multiply two of these elements, again, I stack them, I pull the strings, and I include a factor of beta whenever I have a closed loop. The transfer matrix I'm going to use here is actually a transfer tangle. We call it the tangle because it's not a priori for now a matrix. It's an element of the algebra. So it, it, has, uh, it has two rows, and it depends on... It's written in terms of these face operators with a U and the box with a U is a linear combination of two diagrams with some coefficients that depend uh, on lambda. We recall that lambda was related to the loop weight, and then u, which is a spectral parameter. Okay. In particular, if I set u equals to lambda over 2, this is the isotropic point, where uh, my face operator is then just the sum of the two diagrams with weights 1. Okay. So I'm going to use a specific representation. It's the representation that shows up in the XXZ spin chain. So this is... Uh, the spin chain uh, with open boundary conditions with n sites. The parameter beta uh, is parameterized by q plus q inverse. And this is a very well known, the representation on this spin chain uh, for the, the generator Ej is just this uh, four by four matrix that gives an interaction between sites uh, j and j plus one and acts as the identity on the other side. That's correct, that plus region. Q will be on the, on the Unit circle, yeah. In particular, for my polymer model, Q, Q will be set to I. Okay. 
So if you take the Hamiltonian, which is minus the sum of the generators, uh, you get this uh, XXZ Hamiltonian with specific uh, boundary, uh, boundary magnetic fields at, at the two ends, uh, which was studied by Pasti and Salar and also in the paper by Alcaraz. And my tra what I'm going to call the transfer matrix is going to be my transfer tangle in this representation. This is going to come back in the next slide. Okay, so actually all my correlators here, types A, B, and C, I can write them as matrix elements uh, of my transfer matrix to the power M over 2. M was the, the vertical uh, dimension of my lattice. And for this, I need to set the correct uh, states, V0 and then VA, B, B, B or VC which corresponds to what I have at the top of my lattice or at the bottom of my lattice. So I have to choose them uh, in the correct way. But this, this works. So th basically computing my correlation function on this rectangle here corresponds to computing this matrix element. In the end, I'm interested in computing the correlation function on the upper half plane. So it's a different geometry. And then I'm going to have to take an, a sequence of limits to get from the rectangle to the upper half plane. And then my objective is to extract the correct... Uh, uh, power log behavior, or in one case, as we saw, it's going to be a logarithmic behavior. So the, the, the sequence of limits in our calculations here is how we did it. So first we started with the rectangle and took m to infinity, and we obtained a semi-infinite strip. Then we took n to infinity with, while keeping x and y finite, and then we, we uh, ended up on this first quadrant where x and y are very close to the corner. Uh, then we take x and y much bigger than 1, so this moves them away from the corner. And finally, by taking x and y much bigger than the difference between the two, we end up on the upper half plane. So, of course, a natural question to ask is, if we are taking these limits in a different order, would I have obtained the same results? For example, from the beginning, I can set x to be n over 2 and y to be n over 2 plus r, and then take the limit differences. And, of course, we don't have a general theorem to say that this works, but in some cases, we did do this. So, take the limits differently, and in the end, when we looked at what happens in the upper half plane, we find the same results, independently of the order of the limits. Okay, so so in initially, so two slides ago, I had this, this matrix element. And of course, if you wanted to compute this, you would say, okay, I, on the rectangle, I need to compute all the eigenstates and then project these ones on the different eigenstates. Of course, by taking the first limit, m to infinity, uh, so I'm moving from having a matrix element that involves all eigenstates to something that involves only the ground state. So this is already a first simplification. From this, this is a special beta equals to zero point, so I can use free fermion techniques and write these matrix elements uh, using Wick's theorem and I obtain determinant or Pathian expressions in some cases. When I reach at this point, uh, so my end goal is to extract the conformal weight. One possibility is to say, okay, I'm going to put generic values of x and y. These are the points where I inserted the defects on my lower boundary and then try to compute this, this determinant. In some cases it works. I get an exact closed form and then I study the asymptotics and find a parallel or a logarithmic behavior and extract delta. In some cases, in other cases, it doesn't work. In this case, I'm going to use my Pathian expressions or determinant expressions to do for the correlation function. That's correct. So in some cases, it doesn't work, and I'm going to use these, these determinant expressions to do numerics and again extract the parallel. So the other way is to say, okay, I'm going to take these defects and set them in the corners of my lattice and compute. M maybe in this case, I'm luckier and I'm able to compute these determinants. And this does happen. And when this does happen, I get a closed form, which uh, I study the asymptotics, and then I look at the uh, 1 over n expansion and extract the corner free energy via the cardi fischer formula, and then I can also extract delta in this way. So here is uh, for the first type of correlator, type A. I do a corner free energy analysis. So I take my defect, put it in position 1, and the second one in position n, and then compute the ratio, and I get a determinant expression, which I'm able to evaluate, and then this gives me an exact result, actually, for this, correla for this correlator, uh, Ca when x is 1 and y is n, and the result, there's 1 half log n, and then there's a constant. And there are no further terms. This is an exact result. Okay, so from CFT, we expect that a ratio of partition functions, there might be a first term which is linear, which has a difference of uh, surface free energy. In this expansion, this term is absent. We can see why. Uh, if I compare the two, uh, the two uh, lattices here, we see that macroscopically uh, these boundary conditions are identical. So the defect is in a different position, but overall uh, what I have is a Dirichlet boundary condition. The second term, which is the log term, uh, involves a difference of the two conformal weights, one of them for the numerator and the other one for the denominator. So this first calculation basically tells us that so there are two corners, there's a factor of two and a factor of two here. 
This tells us that the difference of conformal weight between delta A and delta zero is minus one eight. Okay. In order to, to get exactly this minus one eight, we used the other technique. So we did an exact kind of computation for x and y generic, and then we were able to extract precisely uh, the behavior of this of this uh, correlator on the upper half plane, and we get a constant times a power law y minus x to the power one four. Again, this is an exact asymptotic result. We computed the constant in terms of Barnes g function. This, this constant is not uh, is not universal. Okay, so type B. Type B, we do the first thing. First, we insert two defects and two defects in the two corners. So we compute the correlation function, and then we find a log n plus a constant. Then you might say, ah, we had log n in the previous slide too. Right? In the previous slide, we had log n. But this was a bit different. Here we had the log of the correlator with the log n. Here in this case, we have the correlator has a log n. So this is quite a different behavior, actually. So if I take the log of my, uh, the log of my correlator, I get a log log n contribution. So this is not what usually we see from the Caldi-Peschel formula. Uh, if we do now the exact computation and put x and y in generic places somewhere in the center, uh, and, I and I do the sequence of limits to get the result on the upper half plane, then I get that this correlator is some constant k0 times the log of the difference between y and x plus a second constant. We're able to compute this constant, and it turns out that the k0, 2 over pi, is actually a universal constant. So it can be predicted only using CFT arguments. And it was computed by Vassar and Jakobsen in 2014. Okay, so this form with a logarithm is what we usually see in log CFT when we have the two-point function of a logarithmic field that is in a rank two Jordan cell. It has this form. So there is a there is still a parallel, but then we you have this... Uh, It's 2 over pi. Sorry. OK, so and so you have this power law, but then you have a logarithmic correction with this k0 log 0, zero minus z1. And then we can see that uh, if we compare with our exact results, that this corresponds to uh, delta equals to 0. And so our first result, that the corner free energy is a log log n, basically what this says is that uh, the cardi peschel formula usually works when the fields that you put in the corners are primary fields. In this case here, the, the fields that we put in the corners are, are logarithmic partners, logarithmic fields. So the cardi passion formula, I don't think it's known in this case, but clearly there are log log n contributions. Okay, type C. Type C is the one where I have a, a large number of, of defects. Uh, here, the transition between Dirichlet and Neumann, I put them in the corner to do the corner free energy analysis. And then again, I'm able to compute uh, this uh, correlator, and then I get one term which is linear in n, and then one term which has a log n. So again, the result expected from CFT, we had a first term which was uh, due to the difference in surface free energies, and here we see that there is a difference in surface free energy, uh, g over pi, g is Catalan's constant. The difference is between having Neumann and, and Dirichlet boundary conditions. The next term, 3 over 8, allows us to determine the conformal weight of this field here, which marks the transition between Dirichlet and Neumann. And this conformal weight is minus 3 over 32. Again, it's an exact computation. Now, if we put x and y generic, so instead of putting them at the corners, we get a Paffian formula for this correlator. I've been unable to evaluate uh, this Paffian. But I can put it on, my on Mathematica and then fit the power law. And you see that the fit is very nice. And then I can extract the conformal weight numerically. And I get something which is very close to uh, the conformal weight that I computed from the corner free energy analysis. Okay, uh, types D, E, and F for all three of these types. Again, I obtain a Pfaffian formula that I was unable to evaluate exactly in closed form, but I can do it numerically. So for type D, see uh, I did the computation on uh, 1,500 sites. Then I put X directly in the middle and then Y uh, between X plus 1 and the corners. And then we see that, and I fit a power law in the first part. Okay, and this power law gives me a value of delta which is zero point, uh, which is v very similar to the 3.8, which later we will see is, pre is predicted by CFT. Uh, you see also in this diagram that uh, it, it gets worse and worse as we get close to the corner. The reason why this happens is because this is actually a four point function where we have two fields inserted here, but also in the corners we have two other fields which change between Neumann and, and uh, the Richelieu boundary conditions. 
Well, so likewise for type E, we make uh, a bit of the numerical data and obtain something which is very close to one, which is uh, what the CFT prediction gives us. And here for type F, well, I did the same experiment that I did here, but for, va uh, for different values of tau between zero and two. Tau is the weight of these loops that connected uh, subsegment two to the other su subsegments. And every one of these points is an experiment like this. And so you see that uh, the theoretical curve that comes from the CFT prediction uh, matches quite well with uh, numerical results. Okay, so this was uh, what I obtained from lattice derivations. Now I'm going to tell you about uh, CFT derivations. So there are two ingredients that I'm going to use. The first ingredient is uh, the, co the covariance property of the two-point function. So I'm going to consider uh, I'm going to consider the upper half plane H, and if I have the correlator on the upper half plane, I can find it on another domain V. This other domain is this uh, infinite thin strip of width n. And this is the covariance law. So basically, it's the same correlator, and I have to multiply by the derivative of the map that goes from y, which is the coordinate in my thin strip, uh, to z, uh, the coordinate of my uh, upper half plane. Okay, and then I have to put these conformal weights. In particular, here we know exactly what the transformation is. It's just the exponential transformation. So z is e to the i pi y over n. So here I'm going to consider a uh, correlation between uh, two points, uh, z0 and z1 which are mapped by my, by my transformation to uh, y0 and y1, which are di a distance m. And again, the width is n. So this is the first ingredient. The second ingredient is the knowledge of the finite size correction. So a reminder, this was my transfer matrix. It's just my transfer tangle in my xxz representation. So this uh, transfer matrix has eigenvalues, and we know how uh, the low-lying the low eigenstates, uh, we know how these uh, their eigenstates behave. So this includes the ground states and the first few excited states. So they behave as the exponential of, and then you have uh, a large n behavior, which has first uh, a linear term in n, which uh, with a bulk free energy, with a bulk free energy, a term which is constant with a surface free energy, and then a one over n term, which is a finite size correction term, and then the coefficient uh, involves a conformal weight, which depends on i, the eigenvalue that I'm studying, and then the central charge minus c over 24. Okay, so in particular, when I consider different eigenvalues, uh, what's important to note is that the boundary and, and, uh, and bulk free energy, the first two terms do not depend on i. The only dependence on i is in the, the, the one over n term. So this is my second ingredient. So how does it work for type A? So type A, uh, on my upper half plane, this is the quantity, uh, this is my correlator on the upper half plane. And my, hyp my working hypothesis is that uh, this is this probably corresponds to a this probably corresponds to a primary field. In which case, so the the correlation function is just a parallel z zero minus z one to the two delta a, and my goal is to determine what delta a is. So uh, using this, I can use the covariance to compute the correlation function on v, and I use the co covariance law, and then I get this uh, I get this function, uh, so which involves these two exponentials. And then I'm going to uh, study what happens in the regime where m, the distance between my two defects, is much larger than n, which is the width of my strip. And in this case, I take uh, the limit of this function, I take, and then I get k prime times an exponential, a decreasing exponential, and the coefficient is delta a. So that, that's the first way to compute this correlator on v. There's a second way, which uses the transfer matrix. So you can show that this correlator on v, whenever m is much bigger than n, is actually proportional up to some constant. It's proportional to a ratio of two eigenvalues of my transfer matrix, okay? And then uh, to the power m over two. And this ratio, I, I, know, I know how it behaves. So I know that each eigenvalue is, can be written as an exponential with the finite size correction that I saw in the previous slide. And so they have the same bulk and surface terms, which cancel. And the only thing that survives is the one over n term, the finite size correction, the first term of the finite size correction, with some conformal weights. In this case, these I know exactly what these, I what these eigenvalues are and in which sectors, uh, magnetized agent sectors of my transfer matrix they occur, and I know exactly what these weights are. So it gives me a difference of two weights, delta one, two minus delta one, one. And it turns out that delta one, one is zero, so what I get is a decreasing exponential with weight delta one comma two. And I compare the two results and I see that they're identical if I, if I set delta a is equal to delta one, two, okay? For polymers, this is precisely delta one two with minus one eight, which is 
uh, consistent with my lattice result. Okay, so type B, uh, type B is similar, so I'm going to consider a discorrelator with two defects on the upper half plane and the thin strip. So if I do the transfer matrix technique first, I see that I have two leading terms uh, that involve these two eigenvalues, lambda 0 and lambda 2, uh, which in the end give me two exponentials with uh, some, some uh, conformal weights delta 1, 1 and delta 1, 3. So these are different conformal weights in general. Uh, and from this, the conclusion that I come to is that actually this, uh, this, th this change in boundary condition does not correspond to a primary field. It corresponds to a mixture of primary fields, at least two of them that has these weights, delta 1, 1 and delta 1, 3. So in terms of the using conformal invariance, the correct working hypothesis is that you have a mixture of two primary fields, each of them uh, transforming separately under uh, the conformal transformation, and then I do get these two exponentials. So I would get these two, I get these two uh, conformal weights, delta 1, 1 and delta 1, 3. Uh, in order to have only a single one of these two, I would have to impose some conditions on my defects. So if I impose that the two defects on the top connect the two defects on the bottom, the only terms that would survive would actually be the second term. The first one would be killed off. So what happens for polymers? For polymers, uh, something special happens because delta 1, 1 and delta 1, 3 are both equal and, e are both equal, and equal to 0. So in this case, when you look at the transfer matrix, you see that indeed the, the ground state is degenerate, and then you have you have a Jordan block, so it's uh, non-diagonalizable, which changes it changes the behavior uh, of my correlation function. Indeed, so if I use the transfer matrix method to compute the correlator on my thin strip, I get instead of getting these exponentials, I get something which is linear in M, and the fact that I have a linear term is due to this Jordan cell. Okay, uh, so the you in, in, in CFT, the correct working hypothesis is that uh, this field actually corresponds for beta equals to zero to a logarithmic field. And uh, this is the form that we saw earlier. Uh, it gives me the, the correlation function on H. And then if I map it to V, I do get a linear, a linear term with a decreasing exponential. And delta B has to be zero to use the other, the other, the other result. Okay, so I'm going to go over type C uh, rather quickly, but the idea is the same. I put my Neumann boundary condition here on my left uh, side of my thin strip and at the bottom of my of my upper half plane, and then I I make the hypothesis the hypothesis that it's a primary field, and then if I want to do the transfer matrix computation, what I have to do actually is to change my boundary. I, I have to use the Blob algebra, and actually maybe you can't see it very well, but I've changed my defects into uh, I changed my, my defects. Uh, into a, a loop which has a small blob, and loops with a small blob will have a different weight. Instead of it being beta, it's going to be a weight one in this case. Okay, and so I need to know what the finite size corrections are for the transfer matrix of this blob algebra, and these are known from a paper by Jakobsen and Salah of 2008. And the result that we get is that uh, the delta C is equal to delta zero comma one half. Okay, so types uh, D, E, and F work in a similar fashion. Okay, so this is this would be a type E where I impose that one loop, uh, the loop here connects here. Uh, again, with the hypothesis that uh, that these are primary fields, uh, I, I, get, I get an exponential behavior of this correlation function with the weight delta D, E, or F. And in order to, to do a transfer matrix computation, I need to use the two blob, uh, the two boundary temporary deep algebra. And so this is a bit of a complicated diagram where I have two types of blobs, some of them are round and some of them are squared. And then in the end, using this argument, I'm, I'm able to find precisely uh, what, the correct, uh, what the correct conformal weights are. Of course, they match the results that we found numerically for, for the model of polymers. Okay, so last slide before my conclusion. So if we go back to the valence bond entanglement entropy, so if we're on the upper half plane now, we found a conformal field theory prediction for this, this, uh, this correlator. We, we found what the value of delta F is. It's related to the, this conformal weight with R equals to 2 delta divided by lambda plus 1 and the same value for S. And now to compute the valence bond entanglement entropy, which was the average number of, of, these, weight of these loops that connect type the segment 2 to the other segments, we just have to take a derivative of the log of this function with respect to tau and evaluate it to tau equals to 1. And the result 
is something that behaves as a log of the distance between my two points, y and x, then there's a prefact that depends on the model that I'm setting. And this actually, uh, this actually reproduces a result that was found in 2008 by Jakob that. Okay, so this uh, brings me to my conclusion. So in the end, we were able to, to do both lattice results and CFT derivations and find that there was an agreement between the two. And one thing that we found, which was uh, not which, which we had not seen in, in elsewhere in the literature, is this log log n uh, contribution to the Cardi Fischer formula when we have uh, logarithmic fields. Uh, so there are other, so there are future avenues. In particular, we'd like to extend these methods to, to more types of two-point functions. I have actually an extra slide uh, to say what the CFT results are for these to tell you a bit more about these. And then, uh, so to extend the methods to other values of beta, so that we are not only at the at the free fer fermion point. Uh, also, to extend the method to the case where we have either periodic boundary conditions or when we're studying points that are in the bulk, and this is a bit more difficult. So, my last slide, so I presented you six types of correlators. Of course, there are more types of correlators you can define in the loop model. For the first gen natural generalization of uh, type A and B, when I had one defect or two defects, is to have B defects that connect to T other defects. And in this case, the CFT prediction is that the conformal weight should be delta one comma one plus B. So likewise, uh, we can consider on a Neumann boundary condition the case where we have L clusters going to L clusters. So of course type D was the case where we had one cluster going to one cluster. And actually it turns out that uh, type E, remember type E was the one where I had one defect connect to another defect that corresponded to the L equals to two case. So the, the general prediction for uh, the general CFT prediction is that the corresponding conformal weight will be delta one comma one minus L. So this uh, com concludes my talk.